Good morning. I'm glad to have you here with us today. Also this Wednesday, October 7th, we'll begin the uh, Bible Discovery Night that we are going to try. Uh, that'll start with a brief worship service of evening prayer at 6.30. Uh, following that service at 6.30, we will have Christian education for all levels, uh, preschool through adult, and that's when the confirmation instruction for public school will take place. And next Sunday, we'll begin our Sunday school program. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father.
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave your Son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The appointed Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it 
and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, and but behold, an outcry. The word of our Lord. The epistle from the letter to the Philippians, the third chapter. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, 
they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The text, the appointed gospel reading, especially the following. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So far the text. Please be seated. How many of us identify with one-sided love? Who has escaped unharmed the hurt associated with loving someone who does not love you back? The hurt, the pain, the sleepless nights, expectations smashed, and what may even compound that hurt is the apparent unconcern of the object of your affection and how that person has shown concern or lack of concern toward your pain, or worse, the obliviousness of how deeply you love this person. Can you identify with 
the words of Isaiah in today's reading? Does it want to make you more responsive to the love and attention shown to us by God? What is a love-hate relationship? We know love, a delicate, dynamic, and sometimes very dangerous emotion. Those who are madly in love experience exhilarated feelings, highly motivated to work and often achieve high productivity, and with an enhanced sense of well-being, effectively serving God and people. But what if there's a change and love turns sour? And what if it turns into fierce hatred? William Congreve penned those famous lines, heaven has no rage like love to hatred turned, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. In the text before us this day, the religious leaders scorn Jesus and they begin their fiendish plot for Jesus' death. And all of this in spite of God's great and gracious love in planting his people in a lush, well-equipped vineyard. God has a well-equipped vineyard for you to live in. He gives you all you need to be productive in doing his will. And when the people of God veered off into dangerous directions, God sent his prophets to call the people back. And God didn't do this just once. He did it over and over again. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. And more than pity, he had love for his people and his dwelling place. And God still does it over and over again. God who shows great and merciful patience with us. And we know that at the fullness of time, God's mercy becomes evident to the entire world. That at the fullness of time, God sent his son, the promised one, into the world. And Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The door to God's well-endowed kingdom is open, and Jesus warns, and at the same time invites. Jealousy incited in some of his hearers, telling them that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Complacency of the first hearers evident to Jesus. Oh, another teacher with another way of getting to heaven. Complacency continues to the point where they don't hear anymore. Rather be done with the traveling teacher than be changed. Find fault outside themselves rather than in the mirror. And the more time passes, the more things stay the same. Things really haven't changed all that much since the time Jesus first taught this parable. The more time passes, the more people find fault outside themselves rather than in the mirror. It's always someone else who has done wrong. It's always someone else that is supposed to go and do the work that needs to be done. Complacency and its realities settle in. And the reality is that change is no longer an option. Rather finger-pointing and telling others that change is not possible becomes the road followed. Yet our loving Lord Jesus points to another way, and he beckons you and me to turn around. He beckons you and me to respond in faith and fruitful repentance. The attitude that precedes a true act of repentance 
is one of intense outward longing for God's forgiveness and righteousness. In some places in Palestine, counterfeit olive trees grow, called oleander. They're like a genuine olive tree in every respect, but one, they bear no fruit. I'm familiar with another tree, a flowering plum tree called the Cleveland plum. The Cleveland plum is like another plum tree. It has the shape, it has the same leaf coloring, it has the same coloring of the flowers as a real plum tree, but there's no fruit, no plums, a counterfeit plum. That's what a Cleveland plum is. And without fruit, there's death. It's the same with fruitful repentance. For repentance to be fruitful, there's the necessity of faith. For without faith, repentance isn't fruitful, but becomes counterfeit and leads to death. Each of you have been given different gifts in different measures. Some bear that fruit of repentance in more obvious and dramatic ways. Others bear the fruit of repentance in quieter, more subtle ways. God knows the gifts he's given you and the abundance with which he has given it to you. Not all of you can be like Mary Slasser. Mary Slasser served almost 40 years in Africa as a tireless mis pioneer missionary. All who knew her respected her and loved her. And when she died in 1915, they sent all her possessions home. A few faded garments, two Bibles, a hymn book, a perfume bottle, a pebble brooch, a hair bracelet, two lockets, her mother's wedding ring, a watch, a compass, and a fountain pen. Four, in this world's goods. And yet a great leader and powerful testimony of what God can do was someone who bears the fruit of repentance and takes God at his word. Now there's a danger when we read these stories of people of faith. There's a danger when looking at the life of Mary Slasser. And the danger is to hold her up as the ultimate example of what it means to be a fruit bearer in the kingdom of God. Let there be no doubt she did serve her Lord. But to hold her up as the only way of a faithful, repentant person bearing fruit in the kingdom is a disservice to Mary Slesser and a disservice to the Lord she worked for. God gave her her gifts in rich measure. He gave her the ability to be away from family, to share the gospel with people who rarely, if ever, heard it. The question is never, what do I have to do to be a courageous missionary like Mary Slesser? The question is much more personal. The question asked in the quiet, you're facing the mirror. What gifts has God given me? And to use those gifts unselfishly for the furtherance of the kingdom. Sometimes the hardest thing to do is to figure out how to more effectively use the gifts God has given to you and to use those gifts not for your own glory or importance, but to use those gifts to proclaim the kingdom of God to others. We know our Lord Jesus, who at great cost to himself opened the door of the kingdom to you and all people, giving his very life for you rising triumphantly from the grave, conquering death and opening the way of eternal life for you. 
This is what the Savior has done for you out of pure, intense love for you. And what the Savior has also done for you is given you fruit in superabundance that you keep on bearing that sweet fruit out of a repentant heart. For where Jesus comes into your life and intersects your life, the vineyard is plush and rich, showering you with grace and mercy to use his gifts and the fruit he has so abund abundantly and bountifully given to you. Gifts to be used to proclaim the kingdom of God to those who have heard and those who have not heard, that the kingdom of God may continue to be fruitful in this time, until that time when Jesus ushers us all into eternal life. And the kingdom of God is there with us, face to face with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. We confess the common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Merciful Lord, you have planted us as your own vineyard that we might bear good fruit for your glory. Grant to us grace that we may be faithful and show forth in our lives the good works that glorify you and serve your purpose. Lord, in your mercy, gracious Father, Embolden us by your spirit, that we may give witness to your mighty acts. Bless the missionaries who bring the gospel to people who have not heard, and raise up faithful pastors who will nurture the congregations in their care with your word and sacraments. Give us ears willing to hear, minds willing to be instructed, and hearts willing to trust you in all things. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Holy Lord, rescue us from all enemies of your church and bless us with church leaders whose voices will not waver in the face of threat. Bless the president of our synod, the president of our district, and all pastors, teachers, and church workers. Inspire men and women to go into church work vocations and bless those preparing for church work. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Mighty Lord, give to the nations both the desire for and the blessing of peace. Thwart the actions of terrorists and those who would oppress with the power of fear. 
Bless our president and his family with healing from illness. Bless our governor and all who pass, enforce, and judge our laws. Spare us from disease and fear. Deliver the poor from want and help us to provide jobs and worthy employment for all. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Everlasting Father, guide husbands and wives to love and forgive one another and strengthen them in their life together. Bless the homes in which your people dwell. Help parents to be faithful examples for their children and give room in their hearts and homes so that orphans may know the joy of a place and a home to call their own. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, deliver the sick from their illness, give relief to the suffering, help the troubled to know peace of mind, and be with the grieving and those in their final days. Guide all healthcare professionals to serve those in need, and give patience to those who must bear with their infirmities, disabilities, and infertility. Hear us especially for your servants, Teresa and Trish Backus, Joe Bauman, Carolyn Bonin, Brooke Delgo, Doreen Fuller, Brad Haferman, Paul Hiles, Adele Klon, Violet Leonard, Ursula Rhodes, Ron Rogers, Amy Rogenbauer, Lucille Schrader, and Shirley Seehafer. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's body and blood in this Holy Supper, that we may be strengthened in faith, renewed in love, and nurtured in faith by our communion. Give to us unity of faith and harmony in our life together. Bring us at last with the saints who have gone before us, that we may attain everlasting life and dwell in your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Hear us, O Lord, and give answer to the prayers of your people prayed in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom with the Father and the Spirit, you are one God, one Lord, now and forevermore. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver, and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup after supper and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink of this all of you this is my blood of the new testament shed for you for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy. Serve the Lord with gladness. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this gift of salvation. And we ask you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.